the simplest way for two services to communicate is for service A to send a request to service B and wait for a response. And that's it. <laughs> I'm sure you've seen that the video is a few minutes long, so you already know there is more to it than that. So in this video, I'll show you what technologies you can use to implement this style of communication and the implications of choosing this style of communication. This video is part of a 10 episode series on microservices communication and I highly recommend you watch the entire series to get the full picture on this complex topic. The link of the playlist is in the description. Let's take a notification service that needs to get the user information to send an email. If you are familiar with the microservices architecture, you already know that the user information is not directly available inside the notification service. The user info will be stored in the user service. And of course, the two services run in different processes and potentially on different machines. This means that the notification service can send a request, most likely over the network, to the user service and wait for a response. So this style of communication is called synchronous communication. There are several ways to implement that communication style. So you could choose gRPC protocol, so it provides good performance and code generation. You could also use GraphQL, which provides a lot of flexibility in terms of the data you can request, although that's very uncommon for service-to-service -service communication. But one of the most popular option remains HTTP REST APIs. For example, the user service can expose a REST API with an endpoint to fetch a user by their ID. Then the notification service can send a request to that endpoint and wait for a response with the user info. Most developers are familiar with REST APIs. There are a lot of tools and framework to build and consume REST APIs. Sending a request and waiting for a response is easy to understand and implement. But if you choose to adopt this style of communication, it might give you a false sense of simplicity and safety, especially when you are writing the code, because a network call in the code might look very similar to a simple function call. But make no mistake, even if there is one simple line of code to send a request to another service, there is a lot more that happens when a request is sent over the network. To start with, where do you send the request? In the notification service, you could just hard code the URL or the IP address of the user service. But in modern infrastructures, services are deployed and assigned IP dynamically. On top of that, you might have multiple instances of the same service running, and each instance will have a different IP address. This means that on top of implementing your services, you also need to think about how they will find each other and that problem is called service discovery. There are several ways of solving this problem, but the easiest way is to let your infrastructure handle it for you. For example, if you are using Kubernetes to deploy your services, Kubernetes will have a service discovery mechanism built in. I have covered service discovery in more details in episode four of the video series, and I will put a link in the description. But even if you know where to send the request, it doesn't mean that all your problems are solved. Sending a request over the network means opening a connection between two services and a lot can go wrong in between. To start, the user service might be down. This means that you might not even be able to establish a connection in the first place. The user service might be super slow to respond. And if that happens, the notification service will be blocked and waiting for a response. The notification service should have a way to handle it. One way to handle it is to set a timeout and return an error if the timeout is reached. You can also retry to send the request a few times before giving up. But either way, as you can see, there is more to it than just sending a request and waiting for a response. And that's only when two services are communicating directly with each other. So now imagine in a real life system when there are more services involved, one slow service can cause cascading failures across the entire system. So you can watch this next video to learn three strategies to prevent that from happening and prevent a total meltdown. 